Hello everyone. I'm not going to do any coding in this video because I want to talk a bit about problem solving. I just want to share how I see problems when I try to solve them, just in general. And for some of you, this is probably something you already know, as in you may already think in the same way because I think it's quite obvious. But you may also have a different take on things, which is fine, as long as it works for you. It's just that for me, techniques like backtracking, divide and conquer, dynamic programming, and greedy method, they're all actually pretty trivial because with the way I break down problems and visualize it in my head, they become very obvious. So I want to share my approach here because if you're having problems with those techniques, maybe this can help. Plus, I'm going to do more videos later explaining things like how to solve problems using dynamic programming. And when I explain them, this is the general approach that I'm going to use. So what is my approach? Well, it's mostly how I break down problems into sub problems. Again, this is probably pretty obvious to you, but I think that in computing or in real life, we solve problems by breaking down into smaller problems. Of course, sometimes we don't need to. For example, if you ask me to multiply two numbers like five times seven, then I'll just know that is 35 right away. It's just something I memorize. But if you ask me to multiply 55 by 77, then I do that by probably doing five times 37 twice, or maybe I need to do five times seven multiple times. But the point is I solve the original problem by breaking it down into smaller problems of the same type. And this is important because I'm not making a new kind of problem. It is the exact same problem, just with a smaller input. You see, these three problems are all the same. It's just that the input sizes are different. That's why we call it sub problems. Now, when we write in code, we usually break down the problem into small sub problems using either a loop or recursion. Most of us probably learn how to write loops before we learn how to do recursion, but I personally think that recursion is actually more natural when it comes to solving problems, precisely because of how we break down problems into sub problems. Why? Well, because with recursion, it's more explicit. When you write a recursive function, you have to think about how to handle all the different cases and also how to link them together to give you the solution, which is probably why many people find recursion to be harder because you have to be able to generalize the problem. But at the same time, when you write a recursive function, the only thing you have to worry about is the input and output for a particular instance of the problem. That's how I see it. It's like every time I make a recursive call, I'm starting fresh. I only solve the sub problem. With a loop, the separation between each sub problem may not be so clear because you're sharing variables. But with a recursive function, you have clear boundaries. Each one of these sub problems correspond to one function call and have their own variables. So you can just concentrate on solving just one sub problem. You get some input and you have to return some output. Maybe you have to send it all the way to the top. Of course, you have to work out how they are linked together. This is the hard part. And this is probably getting a bit too abstract. And of course, in real life, it's not always that simple because sometimes you may need to call more than one function. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we solve problems by breaking it down into smaller and smaller problems of the same kind. In other words, we break down problems into its sub problems. And again, the way I imagine it in my head is that every time I have to solve a sub problem, I will make one function call. And this model that I have in my mind is basically recursion. So let's see some examples to make it more concrete. Let's say you're given an array and you're asked to find the largest element. How do you break this problem down into smaller sub problems? Well, if you use a for loop to do this, which is what most of us will do, you'll probably start by assuming that the first element is the largest one and you compare it to the rest of the array. So the problem becomes given a number and an array, check if there's a bigger number in the array. And if there is, then replace the original number with the bigger one. In fact, this is actually simpler. Given a number and an array, check if the first element of the array is bigger than the number. If it is, then replace a number with the first element of the array. So here you can see how the sub problems become smaller and smaller. It's always a number 
and an array. And because we check in the first element of the array every time, the array will get smaller and smaller because, well, if the first element is smaller than the number, we don't worry about it. Sometimes we replace the number. For example, here we eventually replace 7 with 9 because 9 is bigger. And we keep on going until the array is empty. So this is how we reduce the problem into subproblems and how we keep on reducing it. Except that there is one inconsistency here. The problem and the subproblems are not the same because the original problem only has an array as an input. So to make this consistent, you have to change the problem. I mean, it's not a big deal. You can start with seven as a starting integer or maybe even zero if there's at least one positive integer in the array. But it's important that the problem is exactly the same with the sub problem because then I will be solving the same problem every time. And I can start by just thinking of an instance of the problem and focus on solving that. In fact, as I said, we don't have to check the whole array. We just need to check the first element of the array. Once I work out how to solve the subproblems, I can then think about how to join them up to solve the original problem. But the important thing here is always, can you break the problem down? Because if you can't, then you're less likely to be able to solve it. And here I am saying that you need to break down the problem in a consistent manner. Anyway, like I was saying before, I see each subproblem as a function call, and I usually represent it as a node of a graph or a tree, like this circle here. So this circle corresponds to the problem of determining if 7 is bigger or smaller than the first element of the array. By the way, I hope you know what a tree is. If you don't, doesn't matter for now, but basically every diagram I'm going to draw in this video is a tree. When I recurse, that is when I'm going to subproblem, that's going to be a different function call. So I visualize it as another node or another circle. And I keep on going. So each one of these circles represents a sub problem. Or another way that I think is that each one of these nodes represents the same problem with, uh, but with a different state because they have different inputs. This is the model in my head. One node corresponds to one function call which corresponds to one problem. Now, with this problem here, each problem only has one subproblem, and each subproblem only have one subproblem below it. But of course, there are problems where you may have more than one subproblem because it depends on how you reduce it. For example, let's say I give you a string and I want you to count the number of times you see the character T in the string. You can start from the left, so you look at the first character of the string, check if it's a T or not. And you keep on doing this until there are no characters left. So the string you have to process becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. But you can also do this by looking at the last character. So you inspect one character at a time still, but this time you do it from the end. Which means that for each problem, you actually have two subproblems because you have two options. And this is the model that I have in my mind. Looking at this tree here, you can either go left or go right. Left means I look at the first character of the string. Right means I look at the last character of the string. And actually, the previous problem where you have to find the largest element in the array, that's the same because you can start from the start of the array or you can start from the end of the array. Of course, for both problems, you don't have to solve both branches. This tree shows you the options that you have. You can go left or you can go right. It means that you'll be solving different subproblems, but it doesn't matter which path you take, you should get the same answer. In fact, if you want to, you can go left and then right. And this is actually an interesting point to bring up, because if you go left, you'll be looking at the first character of the string, and if you go right, you'll be looking at the last character of the string, which means you're going to end up with this string. Which is the same problem you get if you go to the right and then you go to the left, because in both cases, you check the first and the last characters. So subproblems can actually overlap. Now, it's not gonna matter with this problem here because all you have to do is follow one path to the end. That is until the string is empty. But if you have to evaluate every single subproblem and you notice that some are overlapping, then don't do them twice. And this is something we'll often do in problem solving. 
Of course, there are problems where you don't have any overlapping subproblems, but you still have to solve every single subproblem. Take quicksort for example. If you've never seen quicksort before, it's a simple sorting algorithm where you take the first number and you put everything smaller to the left and everything bigger to the right. I may not have sorted anything to the left of 4 or to the right of 4. As you can see, it's still 2, 3, 1 and then 6, 8, 7. But I know that 4 is in the right position. So to sort the whole array, what I need to do now is to sort two more arrays which are smaller. So again, it's the same problem. Here's an array, sorted, but now the arrays are smaller. And I have to solve both of these subproblems because I have to sort both parts of the array. So again, I take the first number and I put anything smaller to the left and anything bigger to the right. Then I keep on doing this. I call the function again using a smaller arrays and so on until there's only one number left in the array. Again, I have problems and subproblems represented in this tree. And this time I have to go through all of them because each one of these nodes are unique. Each node corresponds to a unique problem because each node corresponds to a number in the array. And if you want to sort a whole array, well, obviously you're going to have to look at every single value in the array. Now I'm going to do one more example where I want to discuss how sometimes you don't just go from the top of the tree to the bottom of the tree. I mean, we talk about going through every single node, but what is the order that you do them? Do you start with four, two, six, one, three? Or do you go four, two, one, and then three, six, eight, seven? Well, that depends on how you implement it, right? But basically, you need the ability to go back to a previous node because if you go four to one and get stuck there, you haven't solved the problem yet. So imagine that you're at the top here, you decide to go to the left and solve all the subproblems. Later on, you will have to be able to go back up here and then solve everything on the right hand side. And that is where recursion comes in, right? Because when you start at the top, it's waiting until you finish everything to the left side of the tree and then goes back to the top, and you can start doing everything on the right side of the tree. So I want to talk a bit more about that with the last example. Let's say that you're given a maze and you have to find a path from the entrance to the exit. The yellow cells are walls, so you can't go through them, but you can easily see that there's a path from the entrance to the exit. Now imagine that you're a computer and you got to move this blue block to the exit and you can only move up, left, down or right. So I'm going to draw my tree again and this node here corresponds to the problem state at the start, that is I'm at the entrance. At any given time you have four options, you can go left, up, down or right. At the start, can I go to the left? No. Can I go up? Yes. Can I go down? No. Can I go to the right? No. So not all the options are available at the start. In fact, the only option we have now is to go up. So let's do that. Let's move up by one. And now we have a different subproblem, namely find a path from this cell to the exit. The nature of the problem is still the same in that I have four different moves, left, up, down, or right. This time I can go to the left, I can go up, I can go down. I can't go to the right because there's a wall there. So let's say we go to the left first. And we have arrived at yet another subproblem. We still have to find the path from the current cell to the exit. And this time I can't move left, I can't move up, I can't move down. So I can only go to the right. But does this mean that I'm going to make a new subproblem? problem going to the right? No, because we've been in that state before, namely the previous node. If you make a new node here to the right, then you just go to the left again and you're going to zigzag to infinity. It's never going to stop. So we need to be able to climb up the tree, so to speak, which is the same as returning to a previous sub problem. And you get this by doing recursion. Because when you're doing recursion, this subproblem is still waiting for this one to finish. So we have to find a way to stop us from going to the right because this is the same subproblem 
with this one here. Anyway, I'm not going to discuss how, but let's just say that now we know that this node is not going to give us the answer. So let's just give up. We'll finish that function call and we'll go back to this node where we now have the option to go up or down. If you go up, you'll have four more options. And this is what you keep on doing until eventually you hit the exit. The main point again is that every node is the same problem with different inputs, namely a different starting point. At each node, you always have four options. Of course, some of them are not valid, but you need to check all of them anyway, right? And if at any time you get stuck with nowhere else to go, you just finish up that function call and you go back to the previous function. I mean, it could be the case that the maze has no solution, which means that after trying every single possible move, after going to every single node, you'll just end up at the start again. Okay, so I hope these examples show you how I visualize problem solving. In summary, for me, problem solving is mostly by breaking down a problem into smaller and smaller subproblems. Sometimes a problem will only have one subproblem, so you have this linear progression where you deal with smaller and smaller subproblems. Sometimes a problem can have multiple subproblems. Maybe you only need to solve one of them. Other times, you may need to solve all of them, or at least you have to consider all of them. So potentially, you may end up with a lot of subproblems that you have to solve. Of course, sometimes you can just go down one path to solve the problem. But there are times when you have to consider every single subproblem. You have to solve every single one of them, and this can take a lot of time. And finally, subproblems may overlap sometimes. That is, you may have taken a different path, but you end up with the same subproblem, meaning it's the same problem with the same input, and you should produce the same output. For example, let's say these two red nodes and these two yellow nodes are the same problem. So when this happens, you should not solve the same subproblem twice, meaning that we can combine these nodes, thus reducing the number of subproblems that you have to evaluate. So that's it. That's the end of my overview on problems and subproblems. I think my main goal is to get you to visualize problems and subproblems using a tree, like what I've been doing throughout this video. Each circle you see is a subproblem, which is in a way independent to all the other subproblems. Of course, they're not completely independent because you eventually have to link them together to give you the solution to the problem. But what I mean is that all of these circles are the same problem, but with a different input. So you can focus on each one of them. And again, this is just my take on things. This is how I see problem solving. And I feel like with this approach, things like the fight and conquer, brute force, greedy algorithm, dynamic programming, they're all very easy to understand. In fact, I talk about all of them in this video, just not explicitly. I mean, this last part here is basically what dynamic programming is. I did not name any of them on purpose because I only care about you knowing the concept. Don't worry about the label. You can attach the label once you understand the concept. So if this works out for you, great. If it doesn't, sorry for wasting your time, but just go with whatever makes the most sense to you. Okay, so I guess that is it for me. And thank you for watching.